Open your Bible with me tonight, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. You should always bring your own Bible to church with you because I want you to read and see for yourself what I'm teaching you. Over the years, my critics have accused me of making stuff up. So I'd like for you to bring your own Bible so you can read it for yourself. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. All right, we're going to move really quick. Are you ready? All right, tonight we're going to continue in our study on tearing down strongholds. But also, next Wednesday night, we're going to talk about building good ones. All right? So we've been, we're looking at this, and we introduced it last week, and I'm going to do a quick review for you. Our foundation text is found here in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, that's all of us, right? All of us are still in the flesh. Now, we don't walk after the flesh, but we are in the flesh. All right? How many of you are still in the flesh? <laughs> All right? For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. The word carnal there means they are not temporary or frail. All right? They're not of this temporary world. So we are in a warfare, but thanks be to God, we do not war after the flesh. Or our warfare is not carnal, but it is mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So our, we looked at all this last week, I'm just summarizing it for you. So our weapons enable us to be mighty through God. The word mighty there means in the literal text that because of the weapons that God has given us that are empowered by God, they work through God, right? Then we can say, I am strong, I am able, I can. All right, I am strong, I am able, I can. Say it with me, I am strong. I am able, I can. I love that. Amen? And so, so that, then, then we, we are strong enough and empowered enough and able enough, and we can't pull down these strongholds. Now, that's good because some of these strongholds will look very formidable. All right? Now, what we discovered last week based on, on verse 5 is, you, well, let's read it, and then I'll explain it to you. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, when, most, when, when some Christian people think of strongholds, they think of strongholds that would be like a spiritual entity in heavenly places, Ephesians 6, 12, right? That we, war, that we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers and wicked spirits in higher heavenly places. And there are wicked spirits that set themselves up and try to influence communities or even families, uh, things like that. But that's not what he's talking about here, right? How do I know that? Because he's talking about thoughts and imaginations and things like that. The strongholds that he's talking about here are in your mind. And those strongholds are much more affecting of your life than any enmity that may be over a neighborhood or a city or a nation. Why? Because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You see, it doesn't matter what someone thinks about you. It doesn't matter what the devil thinks about you. What matters is what you think about you. Hmm? It's what's going on in my mind and your mind that turns our lives into what they are. Okay? So now he reveals to us that there are these things called strongholds and that we are to pull them down. That phrase pull down means demolish the demolition and or, and or the destruction of a fortress. Okay? Now last week I, I, I emphasized to you that have you ever watched a television program or a documentary where they are bringing down buildings? Right, and, and if you've never seen that, it's really kind of fascinating. And I really got into it several years ago when they started doing a lot of it. I watched a lot of them. And, and what I was really found intriguing to me was that when, before they blow up a building or cause a building to implode, they spend months studying the construction documents of how it was built. Because if you know how a building was built, then you know how to bring it down. Okay? So if you know how it was built, then you know how to bring it down. And you can bring it down exactly the way you want to bring it down. All right? Now, this is one of those verses that, that, that I absolutely love Scripture for. Because this is one of those verses that just gives you 
wisdom for your life. It tells you what's going on and how it's going on and how it can work against you and how you can get it to work for you. And there's not 19 things to remember. There's three things that make up a stronghold, three things that must come into place for a stronghold to be erected, good or bad. All right? So he says, he tells us that there's to tear down these strongholds. Then he starts with the last step and works down, right? The last step in the process is imaginations. We're gonna explain all of this to you tonight. The second step is high things. The first step is thoughts, all right? A stronghold in a person's life, a stronghold of fear, a stronghold of faith, a stronghold of hate, a stronghold of love, a stronghold of, of inferiority, a stronghold of self-confidence, all of it begins the same way. It all begins with a thought. All right? It all begins with a thought. All right? Now, that, that, now I know some people say, oh, no, there's more than that. No, it begins with a thought. With a thought. Okay? Now, all of us have, we, we talked about last time, we all have thousands of thoughts a day, most of which are harmless. They just kind of bleep across our radar screen and move on out. But every once in a while, we, we, we take a thought, all right? And we take a thought by starting to meditate on that thought, whether it's a thought of fear or a thought of faith. We begin to meditate upon that thought. We begin to chew it mentally. We begin to, 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 to let it revolve. The word meditate means to revolve in the mind. So we begin to revolve that thought in the mind. Right? And, we, and it begins to revolve. It, 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 and some of those thoughts are absurd. Could I hear a good amen tonight? Amen. Right? I told you last week about, you know, a friend, friend of mine that won't fly. Right? He won't, won't fly because he, he, doesn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't trust airplanes. Okay. I mean, I, I, mean, I, can't, I, can't, I, I, I can't even explain that to you. All right, and there's probably some of you in here tonight that, that if I started poking around long enough, we could hit in your life some fear that you have that makes no sense. But yet you have it. And I'm not picking on you. I'm showing you how to tear that thing down so you can be free. It began with a thought, either a thought that came to you in society or friends or family. It came to you in a thought. And, and, it, and, and, it, and you began to meditate upon it. You began to revolve it around in your mind, right? Or you began to speak it. In Matthew 6, Jesus said, don't take a thought saying, right? You can own a thought. You can make a thought yours by beginning to speak it, by beginning to declare it out of your mouth. I can't. I'm weak. I'm no good at math. I can't do that. I could never amount to anything. No one in my family has ever succeeded right? Huh? So you own that thought. That thought becomes yours by speaking it. Life and death is where? In the power of your tongue. Proverbs 6, 2 says you are snared by the words of your mouth. Hmm? I don't do it, you know, but I'm telling you there are times when I'm out in public and I just want to walk over to people and say, shut. It's not because they're saying things that bother me, but the things they're saying about their life, about their kids, about their spouse, about their future. I want to walk over to them and say, please, oh my God, shut up. You have spoken enough doo-doo out of your mouth. I'm getting better, you know, Sam? I used to just, yeah, you've spoken enough out of your mouth to keep you in for the next five years in one conversation. Please shut up. But they just keep on rolling. Hmm? Wow. Wow. 
How many of you are glad you're in church and you can learn how life works? Amen? I mean, I, I am in love with this book, all right? So there's thoughts. Number two, now let's get into it. We talked about thoughts last week. Let's go to the second thought. Thoughts are defined as concepts of the mind, all right? So now he says we are to bring them into captivity. The word bring means subdue, bring into subjection to the obedience of Christ or in compliance to the, now, let, I, I didn't give you this last week. Write this down. This is spectacular. Are you ready? So he's bring every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, he's not saying every thought that goes through your mind. No, he's talking about those that lodge, those that you begin to revolve, those that kind of stick. You know what I'm talking about? He says to bring that thought, judge that thought, subdue that thought, bring it into subjection to the obedience of Christ. The word obedience there means compliance, but listen to this. In the literal text, it refers to the obedience of a slave to a master. So your thoughts are in truth slave to you and to Christ. So your thoughts, you can control them. Don't ever believe the lie of the devil that you can't control your thoughts. I can't control my thoughts. They're your thoughts. <laughs> Amen. Quit believing the lie of the devil. They're your thoughts thoughts. You can put your mind anywhere you want it. Anywhere you want it. So we bring it into the obedience. So, you know, a thought begins to revolve in your mind. You begin to meditate on it, right? You find yourself thinking about it. You know what you ought to do? You ought to judge it according to the scripture. You ought to judge it according to what Christ did for you at the cross and there's resurrection. You ought to judge it. You, ought to you need to submit that word, that thought. You need to submit it to Christ. Amen. That's what he said, right? Now, if you do that, that's the end of the stronghold. Bang. But it's when you don't do that, that then over time, it turns into a high thing that exalts itself. The word high thing means proud adversary. Are you learning anything tonight, right? So that thought then evolves into a high thing. Listen, listen to what it says, that exalts itself, watch. So it, it exalts itself against the knowledge of God. In the Greek text, the word against is a hostile word what it says in the Greek dictionary. It is a hostile word, and it refers to something, something that is lower trying to take something that is higher and pull the higher down and bring the lower up. All right? So the lower actually attacks the higher and tries to bring the higher down and exalt the, high, the lower above it. Now, where does all that come from? Isaiah. Isaiah. Isaiah, pastor? Yeah, Isaiah. God said, I know who you are. You were Lucifer. And you said in your heart, I will exalt my throne above God's. I will sit on the sides of the north. I, the sides of the north means I will be head of the church. So that exalting comes from none other than Satan's kingdom, right? So there's God, the not, look at it again. You got it? Look at your scripture. What does it say? Every high thing that exalts itself against what? The knowledge of God, all right? So the thought comes, and we are to judge the thought with the word, with the knowledge of Christ. Got to get a good amen. But if we don't, then what happens is that thought then will begin to exalt itself against the knowledge of God. That thought will try to elevate itself above what God has said in your life. Are you learning anything tonight, right? So that thought then will, will elevate. It gets proud. It gets arrogant, right? It begins to exalt itself Boy, this is good teaching. Hmm? It begins to exalt itself against the knowledge of God in your mind. It'll actually tell you. Yeah, the Bible says that, but that's not true. You can't trust that. You can't believe that. I know you went down there to church tonight, and that Neiman guy taught you all that stuff. But you can't. It's not right. This is right. 
What you feel is more true than what God said. What your mama said, what that third grade teacher said, what your ex-husband said, that's really the truth about you. Hmm? So it becomes proud. Any of you ever heard thoughts like that in your life or coming from somebody? So that becomes a proud adversary. I get this all the time out in the community. I have people here. Yeah, you know, I, I went to your church. Yeah, I heard you teach all that Bible stuff. But I think, okay, think what you want, Bubba. <laughs> you see what that is? You see what that is? It's right there in front of you. It's right there in front of you. Once you see this, you'll pick it out all the time. You'll see it. You'll, you, you, it. It'll scream at you in the world that you live in. Because there are people all around, I'm not being judgmental, but there are people all around us that have, have strongholds in their mind of doubt and unbelief and all kinds of stuff in their life that is stopping them from having the life that God wants them to have. And it all began with a thought that now is a proud adversary. Amen. All right. So we, what, are we, what, are, what are we to do with these high things? Cast them down. He said, cast them down. Cast down these high things that exalt themselves, right? The word exalt means to lift up oneself, to rise up against something. So it's not just a lifting. It is a rising against, against the knowledge of God. Are you catching that? See, the battle over, the battle here is, is, is which knowledge are we going to believe? Are we going to believe the knowledge of God and build those strongholds? Or are we going to believe the knowledge of the adversary and let them build their strongholds in our mind? Am I going to have a stronghold of faith or a stronghold of fear? Am I going to have a stronghold of love or a stronghold of hate? Am I going to have a stronghold of, of, of hopelessness or a stronghold of hope? Am I going to have a stronghold of forgiveness or a stronghold of bitterness? They all begin with a thought. The guy doesn't deserve to be forgiven. Never asked you to forgive him. Why do you want to forgive him? He's a jerk. You don't want to forgive him. That's stupid to forgive him. Doesn't deserve forgiveness. And he just goes on his merry little life. And you're sitting over here with a stronghold in a year or maybe even a month of bitterness and resentment. And they go on with their life. You know, I've heard it said, some of you heard it right, that, that unfor keeping unforgiveness in your life is like, is like a person drinking poison and thinking someone else is going to die. Hmm? I'm going to hold this and you're going to feel bad. No, they just, have you noticed that? Am I the only one that's noticed that, right? You know, I mean, I'll be honest with you, right? There's times in my life I held on to it, man. I, I you know, I've, I've been honest with many of you, you know? I, that, that turn the other cheek, walk in love thing, love your enemy. I, yeah, that, that was, yeah, that was, that was like, yeah. It took God a few years to work on that with me, all right? And, uh, and I found myself sometimes just holding on to grudges and th meditating on revenge and figuring out how I was going to get even, right? And these other people, they're just living their lives. They're happy. I'd see them around town. Hey, Charles. I'd be, ay, 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 ay. You know, and they'd be getting in their things and, oh, we're going to Hawaii. And I'm, ay, ay, ay. It's crazy. Right? It's crazy. And you know what? See, I had this stronghold of anger and bitterness and resentment. And it wasn't hurting them. It was hurting me. I mean, what's the point? Amen? But see, you see how that stronghold got in me? A thought came to me and said, they hurt you. And, you know, they... You know, and you start meditating, and then you start thinking about it, right? And then, and then that, that, that thing that started low begins to exalt itself against the knowledge of God. See, it starts coming up. Come on. It starts coming up in your life. It starts exalting itself against the knowledge of God. And all the time, God's Word that's up here starts being pulled down because this thing is coming up and up and up and up, and forgiveness goes to the bottom, and unforgiveness begins to reign. Or whatever, hate, fear, poor self-image, right? 
that you, that you can't get off of drugs or alcohol or that you can't get a degree or whatever. All right, let's continue. Are you glad you came tonight? Yes. All right, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, the true doctrines of God. The last step is imaginations, casting down imaginations, right? So it begins with a thought. The thought grows into a high thing that exalts itself. And the last step is it becomes an imagination. Now, the imagination there should have been translated reasonings. Reasonings. All right? Now, if you're taking notes, write this down. This is so incredible. All right? The dictionary says that reasonings, right? Let me, let me read it to you. I'll just read it to you exactly what it says. That way you can get it, okay? Reasonings that precede, precede and determine conduct. Reasonings. So it became, it was a thought, grew into a high thing that has now gained ascendancy over the knowledge of God. And once that high thing gets in place in a while, then that high thing will evolve into a reasoning and that reasoning, right, your ability to reason will then precede and determine conduct. How many of us have seen people do unreasonable things to us, but they were reasonable to them? Hmm? I couldn't sleep the other night, and there's some wild stuff on TV when you can't sleep. <laughs> How many of you know what I'm talking about? There is some funny programming about 1 o'clock in the morning. I mean, like, <laughs> and I got to watching this show about the stu oh, let me refresh. the unreasonable things people do with things that have wheels, cars, go-karts, scooters, rollerblades. And one of them was a kid, like about a high school kid, already had a cast on his arm. <laughs> and he's out in front of a house with his clown friends and he reasoned that he could jump over a car that was coming towards him. I know. I didn't want to watch. I kept telling myself, Charles, you shouldn't watch this. This is sad. But I couldn't take my eyes off of it. It was like, no. And so he's, but... The part I couldn't take my eyes off was, was he already had a cast on his arm, which could mean that he had already done something unreasonable. And the more I watched it, the more I came, became convinced that he is not the sharpest pencil in the box, all right? <laughs> So the car's coming, and his friends are going, you can do it. You can. He goes, I know I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> right? And the car's coming. So he jumps, and he lands on the hood, and then he lands on the roof, and then it's over. Because his next landing place is that somehow he misses the trunk, and he hits the bumper, right? And then it was weird, I guess, physics. You know, you would think he would slide away, but instead, the centrifugal force pulled him with the car. So he's laying there, and he's sliding on asphalt, and it's just peeling the skin off. Yeah, and he gets up, right, and he kind of staggers like this, but he keeps his hand up <laughs> like this. I'm not, any of you seen it? He kind of staggers. I was the only one up, huh? And he kind of <laughs> staggers. I know I should have been praying and reading my Bible, but it wouldn't have this good story. So he's staggering. <laughs> Oh, 
God help me. Right? And so he's, he's staggering, right? And then he tries to walk and he goes, oh my God, guys, I can't walk. And I'm like, no, I guess you can't. You probably just ruptured every disc in your back. But somehow, that seemed reasonable to him. Now, funny story, I guess. We probably all need to repent for laughing at somebody else's stuff, but it's still pretty funny, all right? But here, here's my point, right? Reasoning that precedes and then determines conduct. Now, that whole unreasonable act began with a thought. Hmm? He wouldn't just walk in down the sidewalk and then start running towards the car. No, he thought about it. And I'll guarantee you that God, the Bible says the wisdom of God screams at us in the streets. I'll guarantee you the wisdom of God was standing on that corner going, don't do it. Don't do it. Remember your arm? <laughs> but that high thing, you catching it now? Exalted itself against the knowledge of God, and then it became reasonable conduct. And I just got the feeling watching the show that I'll probably see him again. All right, our world is filled with people that have strongholds that are doing conduct that is reasonable to them, but to the rest of us, we're like, what? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What made you think that would work? What made you think that when you had that thought and God told you no, 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 but you let it exalt itself against the knowledge of God, and then you took that, that conduct would end anywhere other than where you're sitting. It's amazing, isn't it? All right, now let me show you this in action. Are you ready? Right in front of your eyes. Turn to me the book of Genesis. So what are, the three, what are the three steps to building a stronghold? A thought, a high thing, and a reasoning. Right? Once all three are in place, the stronghold is there. It's there. Bang. It's there. Now see if you can pick them out. I, I, I guarantee you, you can. Genesis 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made, and he said unto the woman. Now I'm going to read it to you the way it reads in the literal Hebrew text. Why has God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? What step is that? Step number one, gave her a thought. Just gave her a thought. Notice, it's very interesting the way in the Hebrew text it reads, why? See, he didn't deny that God said it. He knew better than that. What he asked her was, I want you to think about why God said it. And let me tell you something, all right, and then we'll move on. That little ploy right there is being played out across the human race to this very day. There are millions of people right now that are, will not come to church, will not, because they think God is trying to keep a better life from them. Hmm? Well, you know what? You know, I don't understand. You know, why, 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 why is God against sex? God, God's not against sex. God invented sex. Yeah, humans didn't invent it. God invented it. He's all for it. He just wants you to keep it inside marriage. Okay. 
Because if you keep it inside marriage, then it's all going to work the way it's supposed to work. It's when we take it outside because we're smarter than God, and God's a no-fun God, right? And then we end up with all of this other stuff. All this other stuff. Sexually transmitted diseases and all kinds of stuff. Kids without parents and all kinds of stuff. Right? Guilt. All kinds of stuff. Right? Because of thought. Well, God, God just doesn't want you to have fun. He doesn't want you to have fun. No, God wants you to have buckets of fun. <laughs> nah, he does. Amen. All right, are you ready? Yes. Why has God said you should not eat the tree of the garden? There's the thought. What should she have done? She should have turned to the serpent and said, shut up. Get out of my garden. Genesis chapter 2, God told Adam and Eve to guard the garden. Guard the garden. Guard the garden. She didn't deal with it. The woman said to the serpent, we made the fruit of the trees of the garden. But the fruit of the tree was in the midst of the garden. God has said, you shall not eat it, neither shall you touch it, at least you die. God never said anything about not touching it. Go read chapter 2. He said, don't eat it. Now, why Eve added that little part there, I don't know. But she did. Okay? Verse 4. And the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. What's that? What did God's word say? God said, God said in Genesis 2, if you eat the fruit, you'll die. That's the knowledge of God. What's verse 4? That's the high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. Do you see it? It's right there in front of you, isn't it? Isn't it amazing? It's right there in front of us. A high thing that exalted itself, Satan's proud adversary. You won't die. I don't care what God said. You won't die. For God does know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes will be open and you will be as gods, knowing good and evil. <laughs> knowing good and evil does not make you a god. Satan knew good and evil. He was in a snake. He had to get in a snake. I mean, when we look at it from where we're sitting, we're like, really, Eve? Really? You, really, you fell for that? But she did. Okay, so it became a high thing. She didn't deal with it. Verse 6, what's the last step? Reasonings that precede and determine conduct. Watch it, and then we're done. Watch it. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, oh, it's good, it's good for food. Hmm? Reasoning. Preceding, it's good for food. You got the whole garden that's feeding you. It's not like there's one tree that has fruit on it. The whole garden is full of food for you to eat. Good for food. Hmm? It was pleasant to the eyes. Well, if it's pretty, it can't hurt me. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen all kinds of pretty stuff that can hurt you. <laughs> pleasant to the eyes. And look, and a tree to be desired. To make one wise, it's going to make me smarter. <laughs> so it's good to eat. It's pretty to look at. And it'll make me smarter. <gasps> you know, I used to have people tell me that the way Rochelle and I raised Shannon and Jared was wrong 
because we kept so much stuff away from them that they were going to be too naive that we should let them go out into the world and experience life. And I would just look at them like, how could you be that stupid and make it to 30 years old? I didn't say it, but I used to think it. And then I would go, oh yeah, look at your life and look at our life. And somehow you can't make the connection. Now, I know that sounds arrogant, and I don't mean it that way. But see, unreasonable becomes reasonable whenever you take the knowledge of God and submit it to the proud thing that exalts itself. This became reasonable to her. This was reasonable conduct. God says, you eat it, you're going to die, girl. No ifs, no ands, no buts, no maybes. No, you won't. It'll make you smarter. <laughs> you need it to, for food. Oh, my gosh. Okay, let's see if she does it. <laughs> okay, I mean, let's follow it out, right? Reasonings that precede and determine conduct. When the woman saw the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof. There's still time, Eve. Drop it. Walk away. Walk away. And did eat. And gave also to her husband with her, and he did eat. And what do we have there? We have a stronghold. Huh? The next words that come out of their mouth is, I am afraid. Birth into the human race was the stronghold of fear. Birth into the human race was the stronghold of sin, the stronghold of rebellion, the stronghold of doubt that we still battle today. Exactly right in front of us what God said. Did you learn anything good tonight? 